The visitor pattern was the toughest pattern for me to learn, and I know a lot of people feel the same way. Today, I want to show you how I learned this pattern, and I hope that it will help you too. The visitor pattern started to click for me when I began to visualize it more like an alien visitor knocking on my object's door wanting permission to come inside and interact. Today's video will take us through implementing a power-up system using the classic visitor pattern. We're going to touch on intrusive and reflective visitors too, and we're going to dig a little bit deeper into null coalescing operators in Unity. Let's get into it. The visitor pattern relies on something called double dispatch, and I just want to explain that really quickly here. In object-oriented programming, there are many times when the method call can't be decided until runtime because of polymorphism. This is where the concept of dynamic dispatch comes in. It's how the program decides which method to execute when there are multiple methods with the same name. Single dispatch is based entirely upon the object type. Double dispatch, which we're going to be using today, is based on the object type and the argument type. So don't worry about that too much. I just wanted to put that out there in case you read that somewhere and aren't sure what it means. After we define our interfaces and a few concrete implementations, it should start to all come together. So we need two interfaces to make the visitor pattern work. We need an interface for the visitor, and we need an interface for the object that's going to accept the visitor. I'll just move each of these into their own file, and then we'll define our first concrete I visitable, And that's going to be a health component that we'll put onto the player. So we'll define this as a mono behavior and implement the I visitable interface. And I'll let Copilot fill this in here with the accept method. We'll accept the visitor and then allow the visitor to visit this component. And let's add a debug statement there. And I'm going to make another one very similar. We'll call it the mana component. Again, it'll allow the visitor to visit the mana component and debug a message. Again, because these are mono behaviors, we'll just put them into their own file. Now let's turn our attention to the visitor. I'm going to get rid of this little placeholder because we need to define specific implementations for what we're going to do when we visit a health component and when we visit a mana component. So with that done, let's define our power up, which is going to be doing all the visiting. We'll make our power up a scriptable object so that we can make multiple types of power ups and implement our iVisitor interface. It looks like Copilot has this figured out exactly what I want, including the debug statements, which is perfect. But let's uh, have a create asset menu here, and I'll just add a file name. And then again, this has to go into its own file. So now we just need a way for our hero to be able to pick up this object in the game. So let's make another class. We'll just call it pick up, and we can put this on all of our little objects in the game. So it'll be a mono behavior. Copilot already knows. On trigger enter, we're just going to see if we've collided with something that can be visited. And if it is, then we'll allow that visitable object to accept our visitor. And then we'll destroy the pickup. Let's come back to our main player script, the hero. We'll implement the iVisitable interface here. And we're going to keep a list of all the components that are on our hero that should be visited. Now, I'll just call this visitable components, I think. We'll add the health component and the mana component to our list here. And that way, when we accept the visitor, we can just iterate over the list and the visitor can go and visit each component in turn. Now, I'm going to use the get or add extension method that we've used before on this channel. And we're actually going to dig into that a little bit deeper at the end of this video. But for now, let's come down into our accept method, just looping over everything and then calling the accept method on each of those components. Just before I forget, I'm going to jump back over to the pickup script and move that into its own file. Then we can come back into Unity, compile, and start making some scriptable objects. Let's start by defining these scriptable objects. So I'll start with a health power up, uh, but I'm going to add a little bit of mana onto it too, just so that we can see that the visitor is visiting all the components. So I'll put 100 health and let's just leave mana at 10. That's fine. Let's duplicate this and we'll make one that just does mana. So we'll call it mana power up. And for this one, let's put in a zero health bonus. And yeah, let's do, do 50 just so it's different than the other one. Now, our hero needs those two new components, the health component and the mana component. We can leave them at the default values here. I think 100 is fine. And what else do we need here? Let's come over to these pickups that I've got here. So each pickup is going to need the pickup script, and then it's going to need a reference to our scriptable object. So we'll drag the health one into this one. And then on this other sparkly one, let's add the mana power up to that one. So now we're ready to go. That wasn't very much code, was it? Let's give it a try. So 
First, let's visit the health pickup here. So you see right away, the power up visited the health component and the health component accepted it. And then it visited the mana component and the mana component accepted it. If we jump over to our hero, you can see we now have 200 health and 110 mana, just like we expect. Let's jump over to the other one. Now again, we can see all the components were visited. And now while our health has stayed the same, our mana jumped up by 50 more points. So that in a nutshell is the classic visitor pattern. So even though this didn't take a lot of code, the visitor, in my opinion, is still the hardest pattern to learn because it can feel like there's circular logic. Now for me, I had to do an implementation that was similar to what we've done here today, just so I could wrap my head around it. But once I put it all together, I was really able to see the power of this pattern. Next, let's have a look at an intrusive visitor. Intrusive visitor is just moving the logic from the visitor and putting it into the things that are being visited, so our components. So let's add public methods to our components instead of allowing our visitor to access these public properties. Let's change this mana property here. For example, I'm going to get rid of the public. I'm going to change the case of this to lowercase, and I'm going to add a Odin inspector tag, show an inspector so that we can see it. And let's do the exact same thing on the health component here. Let's add a new method here just to add the health. Now our visitor can't touch these public properties. We'll have to go over to our visitor power up there and, and fix that. So instead of changing these public properties, instead we're just going to call these public methods. That's really all there is to the intrusive visitor. So let's hit play and give it another try. Let's pick up the health one first. And so we can see all the components have been visited and the stats on our hero are exactly the same. And we can expect the same thing here. Yeah, it's perfect. Works exactly the same way, but we've moved the logic around. Now, whether or not you wanna do that is a design decision and you might wanna enforce other constraints, but that's the intrusive visitor. Okay, let's jump back to code. The next variation I wanna look at is called the reflective visitor. Now imagine if we reach the point in our game where we have 20 different components on our player, for example. We would have to implement a visit method for each one of these, and that's where the reflective visitor comes in. First, we'll use reflection to try and find a method called visit on the current class using getType, which has a parameter type that matches the type of object O exactly. Now, we'll check to see if we found a matching visit method, and if it isn't the default method that accepts an object parameter, then we'll invoke that visit method and pass in object O. <laughs> Amazingly, Copilot has written this somewhat difficult method uh, correctly. Let's add a default visit method here. It's just going to do no op and we'll uh, I'll put a debug statement. And then just so that we can see that it's working, I'm going to comment out the mana component call here, the visit call. Now let's fix up our visitor interface. We only need one method now, which is to visit an object of type O. Reflection will do the rest, find the method that we want to call. Let's try it out. So now, whenever we try to visit the mana component, we should just run that default method. Let's try it out. Let's come over here to the health one, and yet you can see both of the components accept the visitor, but when the mana component accepted it, it just ran the default visit. And if we look over at our hero, yeah, we can see the mana value didn't change at all, but the health went up to 200. We visit the other one. Now nothing happens because there was no health value to change and the mana component simply ran the default visit. The benefits to this, of course, is that we have a small interface. So the real benefit here to the reflective visitor is that our interface is super small. Now I'm just gonna uncomment all this and run it just as I normally would with it visiting all the components. We'll make sure that the reflective visitor is working the way we think. But uh, while I'm doing that, one more thing to consider is that there's a bit of a performance hit. And I know some people will argue that using reflection in your runtime could be dangerous and it can be. Uh, so I just wanted to put this out there for consideration and you may see this out in the wild. And when you do, you'll know what it is. And if you wanna use it, well, now you know how. Now, just before we jump into the next section, don't forget to hit that like button if you learned something new today. I want to take a closer look at the null coalescing operators and our get or add extension method and how that can solve a potential problem. 
So this problem stems from the fact that Unity has overridden the equality and inequality operators in the UnityEngine.Object class. So that means instead of deleting something right away, Unity simply marks it for deletion at some point in the future. Null coalescing operators in C-sharp cannot be overridden, and that's where the problem comes in. In this first example here, I haven't assigned anything to the animation manager. Then I'm going to get component and assign it in there, and then we'll destroy it immediately. And after each of those operations, let's just see if it's null or not. Let's jump back in here and press play. We should see null, not null, null. So that's behavior exactly like we would expect, right? Good enough. Let's look at the problem now. First, I'm going to remove this code from the first example. We don't really need that, but I am going to assign the component and then destroy it. And I'll uncomment this second example. So here, we've destroyed it. Let's put a new animation manager onto the game object, and then let's try to use the null coalescing assignment operator to get a reference to that new component. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Guess what? Object is null. So this is the problem. Because the frame hasn't completed, the unity equality operator is going to tell us that it's null, but the null coalescing assignment operator knows that it isn't actually destroyed yet. So it's not going to assign our new component into that variable. So let's look at this third bit of code here. I'll just get rid of everything else. We've now destroyed that component, and we're going to use the extension method get or add. So now we can correctly see that the object is not null, working as expected. So that's the problem in a nutshell, really. If you're destroying game objects or anything that inherits from UnityEngine.Object, and you start using null coalescing operators to try and get references to it, you could run into some trouble. So last week we were fetching components, but we had a require component attribute on the class. That means that the component itself, which is required, can't ever be destroyed. Therefore, the reference is never going to be null. So that's fine, but it's not apparent or it's not super obvious just when you look at the code. A better way is to use this extension method. Let's have a look. When we run this extension method, we're first going to check to see if we can get the component from the game object. If it's null by Unity standards, that means marked for deletion, not actually deleted. Then we're going to add a new component and return a reference to that. Okay, I think that's enough heavy topics for one day. I hope the visitor and a deeper look at null coalescing in Unity will help you out. Knowing is half the battle, after all. I've been toying around with some new assets here too. Do you see those shadows on the ground in my scene? That's the new Cloud Shadows asset from Chronic. It's on sale right now too. I'll put a link to it in the description. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. More interesting topics on the way to help you apply engineering patterns and principles to your games. I'll put a couple related videos up on the screen and I'll see you there.